Hello, and welcome to our webinar, How to Design Antisense Oligonucleotides, ASOs, for high on-target potency and minimal off-target effect. My name is Molly Schubert. I'm an Innovation Product Manager in the Genomics Medicine Group at IDT, and I will be serving as the moderator for today's presentation. Today's webinar will be presented by Kim Lennox. Kim is a Senior Staff Scientist in the Molecular Genetics Research Group at IDT. Kim received her Bachelor of Science degree in genetics at Iowa State University. She then traveled to England to receive her master's degree in biomolecular archaeology at the University of Manchester and University of Sheffield. She has been working in the R&D group at IDT for over 21 years. For the past two decades, her work has mainly focused on optimizing methods to inhibit the function of different classes of RNAs, such as mRNA, microRNA, long non-coding RNA, and circular RNAs. During today's webinar, please submit your questions using the question box. Any questions that are not answered during the Q&A session will be followed up with afterward. Thank you for that introduction, Molly. Today's webinar is a high-level overview on what antisense oligonucleotides are, and it's going to cover some of the design strategies that we use to select high on-target potency sites with minimal off-target effects. Antisense oligos are synthetic nucleotides that are designed to modulate gene expression. They're typically around 15 to 22 nucleotides in length and are designed to be reverse complements to their RNA targets. There are a couple of different mechanisms of action for antisense oligos. Uh, they can be RNA-CH1 Gatmer antisense oligos, which are designed to cleave and degrade their target RNA, or they can be designed as steric blocking antisense oligos, which are designed to block biomolecules such as nucleic acids or proteins from binding at that site. RNA-CH1 Gatmer antisense oligos are chemically modified to enhance their nuclease resistance as well as to increase binding affinity, uh, but they still have this DNA uh, domain which serves as a substrate for RNA-CH1 rec recognition and results in cleaving the target RNA. Steric blocking antisense oligos, on the other hand, are chemically modified all the way through, uh, and so they are not substrates for RNA-CH1. Uh, instead, again, they are designed to block biomolecules, uh, such as, uh, for example, the ribosome to inhibit translation, or uh, they could also be designed to block the splicing machinery to alter splicing outcomes. Now I'd like to go over a history of antisense oligos, and I would like to emphasize that they have been around for a long time with the first mechanism of action study published in the late 70s targeting uh, the Rue sarcoma virus. In 1987, the first patent was filed for the Gatmer design by IDT's founder, Joseph Walder. And then in the 90s, uh, we saw some key chemical modifications being developed, such as the 2 prime mo and the lock nucleic acid. Uh, it was then also that the first ASO drug was FDA approved, only to be retracted shortly after in 2002. Also in the early 2000s, RNAi was discovered in mammalian cells, and this was a competing knockdown technology. And uh, along with uh, the ASO drug being withdrawn from the market, uh, we saw a decline in interest in using antisense oligos as a knockdown technology. Uh, but this was changed in the, in the 2010s uh, when we started to see FDA approval of both splice shifting oligos as well as Gatmer antisense oligos. Uh, and some key modifications went off patent such as the 2 prime mo and the lock nucleic acid in, the, in 2020. It's also in the 2020s that we have seen an uptick in the number of ASOs approved by the FDA, importantly, using antisense oligos for personalized medicine is gaining traction, especially in the treatment of ultra rare diseases. 
Today's webinar is going to exclusively cover Gatmer antisense oligos, which uses endogenous RNASH1 to degrade a target RNA. So in the cell, RNASH1 recognizes an RNA DNA heteroduplex and cleaves the RNA strand. The Gatmer antisense oligo is chemically modified to increase nuclease resistance and binding affinity to the target, but in order for it to be recognized by RNASH1, it needs to have a stretch of at least 8 to 10 DNA bases for RNASH1 recognition. So once RNASH1 recognizes uh, the antisense oligo and RNA target duplex, the RNA target is cleaved and degraded by other cellular nucleases, and then the ASO is freed to recycle to find another target RNA, making this whole process catalytic. So what does an ideal chemically modified Gatmer antisense oligo look like? Uh, we've talked about how chemical modifications can help improve the nucleus resistance as well as increase the binding affinity, uh, but there's other attributes to consider as well. For example, it should be easy to synthesize and purify. It should result in normal Watson-Crick base pairing. Importantly, it should be a substrate for RNSH1, and that's what the 8 to 10 DNA bases in the central core of the antisense oligo serve to do. It should have a half-life appropriate for the application, and this is uh, an effect of increased nuclease stability. Uh, it should have effective in vivo circulation time, so it, it should not have rapid renal clearance. Um, it should be able to be taken up into productive areas into the cell where RNASH1 is active, and it should also not induce any unintended uh, off-target effects, uh, whether they're sequence-dependent or sequence-independent, uh, and it should not be toxic. ASOs are a string of nucleobases that are linked together by a sugar phosphate backbone. So there are three main areas that are commonly chemically modified in an ASO. Uh, for example, you can have base modifications such as 5-methylcytosine, uh, which serves to, in part, increase binding affinity, but also reduce immunostimulatory responses. Uh, the most commonly used modification in ASOs is a backbone modification, the phosphorothioate linkage. And this serves uh, to improve nucleus stability as well as uh, increased nonspecific protein binding, uh, which can increase both the circulation time as well as uh, productive intracellular uptake. And then also commonly modified is uh, the sugar, uh, more specifically the two prime position of the ribose. And common sugar modifications are two prime methyl, the two prime mo, uh, or the locked nucleic acid, what we call affinity plus here at IDT. And again, these serve to increase the nucleus stability as well as the binding affinity. Here's a list of the chemical modifications in ASOs that we commonly use at IDT. <clears throat> again, the most common uh, modification is the phosphorothioate backbone. It is still a substrate for RNSH1, uh, but it also incrementally decreases binding affinity by about a half a degree per linkage. And so that's something to keep in mind uh, when you're designing antisense oligos. Uh, but advantageously, it binds nonspecifically to proteins, which really helps with uh, delivery. Uh, so it helps with uh, intracellular um, internalization, as well as keeping the antisense oligo in circulation. The next three modifications are 2 prime ribose modifications. The 2 prime methyl is a natural RNA modification, and it's uh, been reported to be fairly non-toxic. It does increase the binding affinity. It increases the nuclease resistance. Um, in fact, it's resistant to endonucleases that are present in serum and the intracellular environment. Uh, but it's still susceptible to exonucleases, and so you need to make sure that the ends are blocked before you uh, use them in cell culture or in vivo. The 2 prime MO uh, has a methoxyethyl group off of the 2 prime position of the ribose, and uh, the binding affinity is increased further than even 2 prime methyl, 
uh, with uh, the 2 prime methyl has about a one degree on average increase per base where 2 prime mo has one to two degrees per base incorporated. It has a little bit of a reduced protein binding compared to, uh, for example, the lock nucleic acids, uh, which has been reported to have uh, decreased toxicity in comparison to the lock nucleic acids. And it is a little bit more uh, nuclease resistant than the 2 primal methyl. I'll show you data on the next slide uh, showing this. And then the lock nucleic acid, which we refer to as affinity plus, uh, it has the highest increase in binding affinity of uh, any known chemical modification to date uh, with reports up to nine and a half degree increase per base modification, depending on the sequence context and the length. Uh, regardless, it is considered uh, the highest binding affinity modification, uh, but it also does uh, bind proteins uh, more than say the two prime mo, which as we see for the phosphorothioate can sometimes be advantageous, but if you bind, uh, for example, immunostimulatory proteins, you can cause unwanted uh, immune responses. And so uh, there are some unintended toxicities that are so associated with, with locked nucleic acids. And then lastly, a commonly used base modification I mentioned before is the 5-methylcytosine. Uh, this is a natural RNA modification, and its biggest advantage is it prevents the activation of TLR9 uh, when it's placed in CPG motifs. Here's an experiment I performed looking at how chemical modifications can impact the nucleus resistance of an oligonucleotide. I took a naked DNA oligo uh, an oligo that's all 2 primal methyl modified or 2 primo modified with or without uh, three phosphorothioates on the terminal ends and incubated them in human serum at 37 degrees Celsius for up to 24 hours. You can see that the DNA oligo is very rapidly degraded and there's little length product left by six hours. When you put phosphorothioates on the terminal ends, uh, you can see that you have increased nuclease resistance, uh, but you still have uh, degradation by 24 hours with significantly less full-length product remaining. Uh, this is because even though the predominant nuclease in serum is a 3' prime exonuclease, uh, there are still some endonucleases that are present. The 2' prime omethyl oligo is also pretty rapidly degraded. Uh, it's a little bit more stable than the DNA oligo uh, as it's protected against uh, endonucleases, uh, which has been published. But it still really benefits from having those three phosphorothioates on the terminal ends, uh, which you have almost all full length product remaining at 24 hours. Uh, you do see a little bit of base nibbling, uh, which is at the three prime end. The two prime mo modified oligo is more stable than the 2 primal methyl under the same conditions, uh, but you still see uh, the majority of the 3' prime base nibbled off by 24 hours. But when you add phosphorothioates on the terminal ends, you get a very, very stable uh, compound with almost all full length products remaining by 24 hours in these experimental conditions. We've recently launched a new ASO product line at IDT, uh, which allows for improved yield deliverables as well as pricing for our customers. Uh, for our standard ASO products, uh, we have an allowed length from 14 to 24 nucleotides, but our preferred standardized antisense oligos are a 510-5 2' mo Gatmer, uh, where there are five 2' mo bases on the flanking ends, uh, which flank a 10 DNA base core, or our Affinity Plus, uh, which is a locked nucleic acid GATMER uh, with the preferred design as a 3103 design, where there's three Affinity Plus bases on the terminal ends that uh, flank a 10 DNA base core. Uh, they can be ordered as standard desalts for all of the scales that we provided, or for the 200 nanomole scale, they can also be ordered as HPLC purified. 
We're often asked the question how the different chemical modification strategies perform functionally. And so I've looked at a handful of sites comparing a 2 prime methyl gapmer to a 2 prime mo gapmer and an affinity plus gapmer at the same site. And so here I'm just showing an example of one of those sites, uh, the beta catenin gene in HeLa cells using lipofectamine 2000 at 10 nanomolar or 3 nanomolar doses. And these are the standard 20 mer gap mer designs for the 2 prime methyl and the 2 prime mo. For the affinity plus, since there are 3, 10, 3 gap mers, I truncated the ASO site down uh, two nucleotides on each side. So it's centrally located uh, within the 20 mer gap mer site. And looking at these seven different sites for beta catenin, this is pretty textbook results of what I've always seen, where the 2 prime methyl gapmer uh, works well for knockdown. Uh, the 2 prime mo uh, outperforms the 2 prime methyl gapmer, and the affinity plus gapmer is consistently uh, the most potent uh, antisense chemical modification strategy. And so this is true for every site, uh, except for one where you see that the 2 prime methyl and the 2 prime mo gapmer are, are equipotent at site 1576. Uh, but for the most part, this is pretty standard of what I see uh, where uh, the 2 prime mo outperforms 2 prime methyl with the affinity plus gapmer being the most potent. So now that I've shown you some functional data comparing the 2 prime mo gapmers to the affinity plus gapmers, uh, what are some of the guidelines on selecting which chemical modification strategy to use? Uh, for example, if affinity plus gapmers are always more potent, why would you choose 2 prime mo gapmers in the first place? Uh, well, as we saw, the 2 prime mo gapmers do have reduced potency compared to the affinity plus gapmers. And they also have reduced gymnotic uptake. And so gymnosis is uh, delivering the antisense oligo naked, so without a transfection reagent. And uh, this seems to be less effective with 2 prime mo compared to the affinity plus gapmers, uh, but still a viable way to deliver 2 prime mo gapmers. So compared to the affinity plus gapmers, the 2 prime mo ASOs are less toxic. Uh, they do have increased specificity, uh, and this is importantly for having off-target effects, so sequence-specific off-target effects, uh, since we, I try to keep the binding affinity of both of the uh, 2 prime mo and the affinity plus gapmers uh, the same for potency reasons, uh, but if then you have a 16 mer uh, ASO compared to a 20 mer ASO for specificity against the transcriptome, uh, it's easier to find specificity with a 20 mer than it is with a 16 mer. And so uh, you are more likely to have sequence specific off target effects with the affinity plus gapmers, uh, which make them more difficult to design. Uh, and then importantly, the 2 prime mo gapmers uh, have been approved uh, by the FDA where the Affinity Plus Gapmers uh, have not yet been approved by the FDA. I've discussed our standard Gapmer ASO products at IDT, but we also have uh, the ability to order custom ASOs on our ASO webpage as well. Uh, it has more flexible length from 12 to 36 nucleotides and uh, more flexible uh, options as far as chemical modifications go. So you can include different modifications such as the 2 primal methyl that we just saw or 5-methylcytosine, uh, which can, as I mentioned before, be important to uh, block TLR9 activation uh, and is now commonly used in the DNA gap of GAPMER antisense oligos. Uh, you can also vary their position and the number of modifications that you have. So for example, if you want to create a steric blocking antisense oligo, you can put modifications, um, for example, every third nucleotide. Uh, 
uh, or you can modify the entire antisense oligo for steric blocking applications. Uh, you can also reduce the phosphorothioate content, uh, which has been shown to reduce toxicity, especially uh, when delivered to the brain. And all of these uh, products are set prices, again, with uh, set yield deliverables and set prices uh, ordered as standard desalts with uh, the 200 nanomole product also having the option to be HPLC purified. IDT technical support can help with designing your antisense oligos. Uh, it's actually pretty tricky to identify potent antisense sites in silico, uh, but over the years I have optimized different parameters uh, and come up with kind of a decision tree as far as which parameters are more important than others in enriching for good antisense sites. And so one of the strategies that we use is to eliminate the sites that are predicted to perform poorly uh, with the intent that if you get rid of the bad sites, you're more likely to hit a good site. And so the next series of slides are going to cover some of uh, the parameters that I use when I'm designing antisense oligos and kind of help you understand the decisions that are made uh, when we are doing these designs for customers. One of the more important considerations that I take into account when designing ASOs are biomolecular interactions that can occur within the ASO sequence itself. Uh, for example, an ASO may form a hairpin structure, and if the stem formation is thermodynamically favorable uh, in intracellular conditions, it may restrict the ability of the ASO uh, to bind in its linear form to its RNA target. Uh, this can be especially problematic with high binding affinity modifications. Uh, in this example below, I have a 3103 Gatmer sequence uh, where there's three uh, affinity plus modifications on both the five prime and the three prime end. And thermodynamic studies uh, have shown that a locked nucleic acid or the affinity plus modification binds stronger to another affinity plus modification over RNA. So an affinity plus affinity plus base pair is stronger than an affinity plus RNA base pair. And so it may be preferred uh, to bind to itself than to bind to its RNA target. Additionally, if there is a hairpin structure that's formed by the antisense sequence, uh, its reverse complement RNA target may also form the reverse hairpin. And this could further restrict ASO accessibility to its target. There's also been studies to show that hairpins um, formed by ASOs bind proteins to lesser degree. And uh, we've discussed this uh, previously, but uh, pro to this may be that it might reduce toxicity in that uh, you might be at lower risk of binding immune stimulatory proteins. Uh, but the con might be that it also might affect biodistribution or reduce the uptake efficiency because it's not binding to the proteins that help facilitate this. Another biomolecular interaction to be cautious of when designing antisense oligos is the ability for the ASO to form a self-dimer. Uh, this self-interaction can also be thermodynamically favorable uh, to the point where it may interfere with antisense hybridization, uh, especially when high binding modifications are incorporated, similar to the hairpins. Uh, there haven't been any systematic studies published that show that self-dimerization negatively affects ASO potency. However, it should still be a parameter that's considered when designing ASOs and something that we take into account. The length of an ASO can also impact the function of the ASO, and it's generally accepted that chemically modified ASO gapmers between 16 to 20 nucleotides long 
are an ideal range for both optimal potency and specificity. Uh, in general, an affinity plus GAPMER is optimal between 16 to 18 nucleotides long, and for two prime mole GAPMERs, this range is 18 to 20 nucleotides long, um, obviously with, with some exceptions. But when you start getting shorter than 16 nucleotides, uh, you might negatively impact the function of the antisense oligo. Uh, for example, uh, it becomes more difficult to meet the optimal binding affinity for target hybridization. Uh, additionally, if you do meet that optimal binding affinity, uh, now you've got a short oligo where you compromise the specificity to the transcriptome. It is more difficult, as I mentioned before, to uh, find uh, sequences which don't have off-target effects when you start getting into the 16 nucleotide long range or less. And they're more likely to bind to an off-target RNA. Addition, this is less important uh, unless you're starting to get really short, but uh, you do need a minimum number of phosphorothioate uh, linkages in order to sufficiently bind proteins to help facilitate cellular internalization of the antisense oligo. And this number is, is 10. And so if you have less than 10 phosphorothioate linkages, you start uh, reducing the ability uh, for the um, productive uptake of these antisense oligos. When you start getting above and beyond 20 nucleotides, uh, there seems to be a length penalty. Uh, for example, above 20 nucleotides, you're more likely to exceed uh, the optimal binding affinity. Uh, and when you do exceed this, you're not increasing potency uh, because it is the optimal for potency. The only thing that you're doing is increasing uh, the ASO tolerance to mismatches. So you're re reducing specificity. Also, if you start getting too high of a binding affinity, uh, you reduce the off rate of the antisense oligo. If you remember from uh, an earlier slide, uh, GATMER ASOs are a catalytic process. So they come off the target and they find a new target to degrade. And so if you have too high of a binding affinity, you can reduce this off rate and decrease the potency. Also, longer ASOs are more prone to form biomolecular interactions with each other, such as hairpin structures and um, self-dimers. And uh, the longer you get, the less favorable uh, it's been reported for gymnotic or naked uptake. Another parameter to consider when designing antisense oligo is GC percent. And this is the percent of the ASO sequence that's either guanine or cytosine. And so GC base pairing is more thermodynamically stable than AT base pairing. And so it is correlated with uh, melting temperature of the antisense oligo. And we generally find that the optimal range for GC content for an ASO is typically between 40 to 60%. And this is if you're also staying within the guidelines of the length requirements that I discussed on the last slide. When you start going below the 40% GC content, uh, you might not achieve sufficient binding affinity uh, to bind to your target RNA. And when you start going above the 60% range, uh, you may exceed the threshold affinity, which we talked about before, where now you've, you are above the optimal binding affinity, so you're not improving potency. You're just putting the ASO at risk uh, for increased off-target effects. Also, having too high of a GC content uh, can increase the probability that your ASO is going to form a secondary structure or a self-dimer. And it's also been reported that excessive Gs can cause both toxicity, especially with the affinity plus modifications, or can cause anti-proliferative responses. And this can be also problematic with certain G-rich sequences uh, that form G-tetrads. And these G-tetrads can stack into these square planar arrangements uh, in the presence of these monovalent metal ions, which I have shown here. And when it does so, it can form these G-quadruplex structures, which can be uh, immunostimulatory and can also 
uh, prevent the ASO from binding to its RNA target. The next ASO design parameter I'm going to discuss is target accessibility. So we've looked at how the ASO sequence itself can potentially impact the function of an ASO, uh, but it's also important to look at the RNA target to see if there is anything that could possibly uh, reduce the accessibility of an antisense oligo. Uh, as we know, RNAs are, are complexly organized. Uh, they fold back on each other on itself, uh, forming hairpin and tertiary structures. Uh, they can have uh, RNA binding proteins bind to them, which can impact accessibility. Uh, they can bind to other nucleic acids or have microRNA binding sites. Uh, and also the localization of the transcript itself can be important, uh, where by it needs to be in proximity to where RNASH1 is localized in order for an RNASH active GATMR to be functional. Keep in mind that RNA binding proteins are generally uh, not binding with a high enough affinity to outcompete an antisense oligo. And this makes sense because as we know, antisense oligos can function well as steric blocking oligos uh, whereby they block like the translation machinery or they block the splicing machinery. And so uh, RNA binding proteins uh, can be uh, less of an impact potentially than secondary structure of the target or binding to nucleic acids, uh, but still something that you should keep in mind when you're designing antisense oligos. Off-target effects, or OTEs, are another very important design consideration to take into account for GATMR ASO design. Uh, they can be hybridization dependent or hybridization independent. Uh, the hybridization dependent off-target effects uh, happen when a GATMR ASO hybridizes to and changes either the expression of or the processing of or the functioning of an unintended RNA target. It's likely that the dominating mechanism for OTEs from a GATMR ASO is through degradation of a non-targeting RNA. However, uh, there's also the possibility that it can uh, kind of serve as a steric blocking antisense oligo blocking either protein or RNA binding at an off-target site. Uh, the influences that are uh, involved in whether or not an ASO will have an off-target effect uh, include the overall binding affinity of an ASO. The higher the binding affinity to an off-target, the more likely it's going to uh, have an off-target effect. Uh, the number and position of mismatches that are between the antisense oligo and the unintended RNA target uh, are also an important influence, as well as mismatch favorability. Uh, for example, in most cases, a GT base pair is more favorable than a CC mismatch base pair. And so that's something to take into account. Uh, but all of these effects of mismatches uh, and their effect on the melting temperature of an ASO can be calculated in silico using tools such as Oligo Analyzer, which is a free tool on the IDT website. And keep in mind that even if it's predicted to bind to an off-target RNA, that RNA must be expressed in the cell type that the ASO is present in, and it also must be accessible to the ASO similar to the on-target RNA. Ways to uh, prevent or control whether or not uh, an off-target effect is going to occur is uh, that you can eliminate sites that are predicted to bind to off-targets in silico. Uh, this can be do, done uh, through either NCBI blast searching or uh, a blast search on Ensemble database. Ensuring that at least three mismatches are present to any untargeted RNA sequence in the transcriptome. Uh, it's important to evaluate two ASOs of the same target RNA to make sure that you get the same phenotype from both antisense oligos. And also, it is very, very important uh, to include appropriate negative control ASOs that are chemically modified 
um, the same way with similar binding affinities and GC content to the on-target antisense oligo. For hybridization independent antisense or off-target effects, uh, these can be either sequence specific or sequence agnostic. Uh, for example, uh, sequence specific off-target effects can uh, result from CPG motifs that are present within the DNA domain of a Gatmar antisense oligo, which can stimulate TLR9. Again, these can be prevented by using 5-methylcytosine bases instead of uh, cytosine. And also, uh, if you have excessive Gs uh, or even G-specific motifs, uh, this can cause toxicity uh, when using Affinity Plus Gatmar antisense oligos. Sequence agnostic can occur, for example, with uh, phosphorothioate uh, binding non-specifically uh, to activate the complement pathway. Uh, this is can be a concern with DNA phosphorothioate oligos. And also uh, DNA, this is not as much of a concern for antisense oligos, but uh, just keep in mind uh, that you could possibly have an effect from the CGAS sting pathway, but this is more uh, prevalent with longer and double-stranded DNAs. We're often asked the question which purification option is suitable for various experimental conditions. IDT offers two different purification options for ASOs, our standard desalt purification or our HPLC purification with sodium ion exchange. The standard desal option is our minimal purification option, and it comes with a decreased cost of the ASO and faster turnaround time. However, there's no purity guarantee. When we feel that standard desal is an appropriate purification for cell culture screening to identify potent ASO sites. On the other hand, HPLC purification with sodium ion exchange comes with an increased cost and a slower turnaround time for the ASO, uh, but it often does come with a purity guarantee of greater than or equal to 85% full length product. Uh, and it, we feel that it's appropriate for in vivo studies. I did want to assess the uh, purity of our standard desalt 2 primo GAPMERS. And so I took 340 of these 2 primo GAPMERS uh, that were synthesized from 17 different orders over the last five years. And I submitted them for CE analysis to see what the percent full length product for each ASO was. So each dot on this graph represents an individual ASO and a colored cluster represents ASOs from the same order. And so overall, for all of these 340 different 2 primo GAPMERS, the average full length product uh, was around 95%. The last topic I'm gonna discuss in this webinar are the different ways to deliver antisense oligos. So in cell culture, cationic lipids are often used as they can very quickly and efficiently deliver nucleic acids at a relatively lower dose. However, the drawbacks are that they can sometimes have associated toxicity and they don't always perfectly recapitulate the in vivo results. Gymnosis, on the other hand, uh, is an effective delivery method for antisense oligos. So this is naked delivery without a delivery tool. And uh, antisense oligos can be delivered gymnotically uh, because of the chemical modifications they have, specifically the phosphorothioate backbone helps improve intracellular uptake. And this method can be used both in cell culture and in vivo. However, it does require a higher ASO dose. Uh, sometimes uh, you might need a thousand times the dose which is required using cationic lipid to achieve the same knockdown effects. However, it does or it has been reported to better predict in vivo activity uh, and it is the delivery method that's often used for intrathecal delivery to the brain. One of the drawbacks to gymnotic delivery is when uh, systemically used, uh, it can have 
a broader distribution of the ASO and uh, perhaps be taken up in cells uh, where you don't want to see the activity and cause unintended uh, toxicities. And so to improve cell selectivity, uh, you can use conjugates. Uh, for example, cholesterol was one of the first conjugates that was used. And this can improve ASO delivery to liver. However, it also does deliver to extrahepatic tissue uh, with any cells that would contain or would express the cholesterol receptor. Palmitate is uh, becoming a more popular conjugate used on antisense oligos, and it can increase ASO uptake in both cardiac and skeletal muscle tissue. And Galnac is one of the most specific conjugates uh, as this is a ligand that is uh, recognized and taken up only in hepatocytes. And so using uh, these conjugates can enhance uh, tissue or cell specificity, uh, requiring a lower dose and um, possibly reducing overall toxicity. Thank you for attending our webinar today covering the basic use of ASO GAPMERS. If you do have any further questions, we have resources available online on the IDT website. Uh, for example, we have uh, protocols and user guides that can help with delivering ASOs in cell culture. And there's also an extensive guide on ASO design strategies that includes a lot of the material I talked about today, as well as references. Uh, so at this time, I'm happy to address any questions that you may have. Thank you, Kim, for your very informative presentation. We have received several questions from our audience. The first question is, can you attach fatty acid conjugates or GALNAC to an ASO? We can. Uh, we currently only have cholesterol in our catalog but we also offer many other conjugates as well. For example, we can do tocopherol, sterol, palmitate, DPPE, and DOPC, uh, but they do need to be reviewed by our non-catalog committee to evaluate the compatibility with the ASO chemical modifications that you have, as well as to make sure that there aren't any uh, sequence complexities. There may be other fatty acids too that we can do. It just really depends on if it's commercially available in a form that we can attach to an oligo. For GALNAC, this is something that we uh, frequently attach to an ASO. Uh, we can attach the trivalent or the single insertion on either end of the ASO or the triatenary on the five prime end only. Uh, so just feel free to reach out to our technical support group and they can assist you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, moving on to the next question, uh, we have someone here asking if we have GMP ASOs available. That is another great question. Uh, we are currently in the process of building a TOM facility for therapeutic CGMP oligos, but the initial focus is going to be on CRISPR guide RNAs. We hope that once we have built out our capabilities to manufacture CGMP guide RNAs, that this will help build a foundation to easier expand our portfolio to other therapeutic oligos, and this would include ASOs. Our ultimate goal is to eventually be able to assist our customers from the ASO screening stage through preclinical development. We are building the sales funnel right now, so understanding what your GMP ASO needs are is actually valuable information for us, so please contact either me or your sales rep uh, with regards to your CGMP ASO needs. Great, thank you. Uh, moving along here, uh, someone is asking, do you provide endotoxin testing on your ASOs? We do. Uh, so we can perform endotoxin testing for an additional fee, uh, but it needs to be quoted through our custom quotes team, uh, which you, who you can contact. However, we don't use those results to gate the product through our system. So regardless of what the results are for endotoxin, you know, whether it passes or fails, the ASO is still going to be shipped along with the endotoxin report. 
So if you do have concerns about sterility, you can always use a 0.2 micron filter uh, before use to further purify the prep. I personally haven't had to do this for cell culture work uh, for the thousands of ASOs I've tested over the years, uh, but this is something that would be recommended for in vivo testing. Great, thank you, very informative. Um, looking through here, uh, okay, so someone here is asking, can you order dye labeled ASOs? Uh, yeah, we have a wide variety of options for fluorophores to choose from. This is a question I'm actually asked quite often, uh, which dye should be used and which end of the ASO to put it on. And so I recently looked at how the side dyes and a handful of the addo dyes impact the function of an ASO. Uh, what I found was that the ASO still functioned quite well from a potency standpoint. I mean, there was some negative impact, but it was actually less than I expected. And it seemed to be agnostic to whether you put it on the five prime or the three prime end. Uh, they both worked equally well. So this data will be on our ASO webpage soon, but please reach out in the meantime if you have any specific questions about a specific dye or sequence or chemical modification that you're interested in, uh, and we can help walk you through where to put it, which one to put it on, and, and kind of like the process to using delivering ASOs with dye labels on them. Great. And what happens if you don't see any knockdown in your ASO experiments? Uh, well, the first thing that I would ask is if a positive control was tested to make sure that there wasn't an issue with delivering in your cell type. Uh, if this was done, the second thing I would do is take a look at the qPCR assay. So we always run two, Q two qPCR assays for our test ASOs uh, and positioning them near the five prime end and the second one near the three prime end in case there's uh, retained RNA fragment after cleavage, uh, or if there is a gene isoform that's being quantified by the qPCR assay that isn't targeted by the ASO. Uh, unfortunately, not all transcript variants are perfectly annotated in either NCBI or Ensemble, so this does happen. Uh, but if this also checks out, more ASOs may need to be screened. As I mentioned in the webinar, in silico, ASO site selection isn't perfect, and some RNA targets are just more difficult to knock down than others. Uh, another good control to use is to see if a dicer substrate RNA, which is uh, also in, uh, we saw here, IDT, uh, if this can knock down the target, uh, and this can help validate that knockdown is achievable for your target using an orthogonal approach. Fantastic, thank you. That kind of leads us into this question. So um, can you use ASOs for high throughput screening studies? Are there any best practices that you can share? Yes, our new ASO products can help with this since now we offer lower ASO amounts at a lower cost uh, exactly for this purpose. Uh, before we used to offer full yield at full cost and it wasn't as amenable for high throughput screening, um, but this new product line uh, will really help with this. In a perfect world, obviously the more sites you screen, the better, as you're more likely to identify the most active site for knockdown. But we realize that not everyone has the resources or the time to do a single base micro walk throughout your target. We can help with designing your screen based on how many ASOs you are able to test to make sure that you're testing the right subset of ASOs for your platform. For example, I've helped customers who were only able to test 10 sites, uh, some that were able to screen 100 sites, some who wanted just to test the best site available incrementally, say like every 50 bases or every 100 bases. And some of them are able to test every site possible doing that micro walk. What we can do is help tailor your screen to what suits you best. So please feel free to reach out and our technical support group or myself can help you with uh, designing your screen. Great, thank you so much, Kim. Uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time to answer additional questions. So we will contact you directly if you asked a question that wasn't answered here today. Again, I would like to thank Kim for her time with us today. 
And lastly, thank you again for attending and we wish you the best of success in your research.